Welcome again, ladies and gentlemen, my beloved brethren and sistren, to the Tawahado Bible Study Podcast. As always, make sure to subscribe, share, and support. You may subscribe wherever these words are entering your eardrums, be that YouTube, Transistor, Anchor, Apple, Google, Spotify, Wazata. You may share the very words of God that you hear read aloud and recited. And you can also share your thoughts in ratings and reviews, which allow more and more ears that hopefully hear to hear more and more of these words of God. You could also share the link to wherever you found this. You may support at patreon.com slash aksum, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash A-K-S-U-M. Last week, we did the scroll of Romans chapter 8 from verses 1 to 17. Now, we'll finish that bad boy by going through verses 18 to 39. I try to do a chapter a week, but sometimes I slow it down. And you can't go wrong with slowing it down. It means you get to chew on the scriptures for a longer time. And as we have learned from the slow food movement, that's probably healthier for you to do. Without further ado, Romans 8, 18 to 39. But we'll begin with 18 to 25. KJV. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption, to wit, the redemption of our body. For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. We see here a continuing theme of where we left off last time, which is to say an exploration of the liberty and freedom that we have in Christ, this pursual of adoption. Though we did not deserve it, we are declared genuine. We are adopted, chosen, selected, elected by God. And he's telling us not to place our superlative and utmost trust in the things that we are seeing the things that we can subject to our five senses, but rather to place our trust in the unseen, which is his word, which in a sense is interacting with our senses in that our faith comes from hearing. And we'll see that uh, as well in, in Romans. But we will continue to verses 26 to 30 to fill the picture out a little more. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate 
to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. Now I've been telling my, my Sunday school, which is <clears throat> restarted here in July of uh, 2021, in person at the end of the pandemic which we've known from 2020 to 2021 we had studied a lot digitally but this is the first time now a couple of weeks that we've done it face to face and i've been recommending to them that they switch around different versions i'm reading the kjv not to confuse you or to flex my english but because it's in the public domain and i appreciate that but i encourage you to check out various versions try the new king james version Try the NIV, try the message, try David Bentley Hart's New Testament, try N.T. Wright's New Testament. Whatever gets you to read more, do that and then realize that the English is not in charge. The English is an invitation to read the original Greek. If you're not going to do that, trying to do different styles, that is word for word translations, as well as thought for thought, literal translations and dynamic translations, will help you understand the text more, but the important thing is to keep on reading. I'm not giving you the final word on Romans 8, verses 26 to 30 right now. I'm introducing the text to you, laying down the foundation so that you can continue to build on it until your last breath or until the Lord comes again to judge the living and the dead. I paused here for reflection because there is a controversy in the Ethiopian church, at least, around the idea of the intercession of the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit, and we'll see later the intercession of Christ. I'll bring this up again when we get to Christ, but one thing I'll, I'll want you to understand is the way in which God the Son and God the Holy Spirit act in similar ways, behave in similar ways. Just pay attention to their connection. And appreciate that it is not Deacon Henoch who made up this word intercession here. And it's, uh, don't try to twist words, but definitely go and study the Greek if you need to. Just understand the Holy Spirit intercedes. And the intercession of the Holy Spirit is different than other forms of intercession that we've talked about. Or, or sometimes you'll see the word mediation. Again, I'll get to it when we get to Christ's mediation and intercession. But there are these unexpressed unutterable groanings that are happening on your behalf. You can't understand them. They're not clear and comprehensive. You don't really know how to do that. People sometimes ask me, how is it that I got to serve the way that I serve? I don't have a full answer for you. My parents didn't grow up going to church. They baptized me cradle Orthodox, uh, as was their duty, and as I'm sure their parents and their immediate family pressured them not as peers but as seniors to do and they could have if they wanted to resist and they they didn't beyond that they sent me to a few different christian schools including a middle school including uh, a kind of uh, secular humanist but still vestige of religion high school including an undergraduate university including even a Montessori school with some born-again uh, Christians. So I've had so many different influences. My own mother read scripture to me as I would go to bed, probably until I was 10 or 11 years old. So there are a number of things I could point to. But for me, I point to the unutterable groanings of the Holy Spirit's intercession in my life that has brought me to the point so that I could read these words to you aloud and have some semblance of understanding and continuity in my service so that I could please God more and more and more. The Spirit does this for all the saints, all the holy ones. And the Spirit does this not on uh, his own initiative, but in accordance with, in agreement with the will of God, the Father. So, there's a common misunderstanding. A lot of people know just a little chunk of this phrase in Amharic. They'll say, All is for the good. All works out together for the good. No, no, no. Finish it. All works out for the good or all works out well for those who pursue 
the will of God. That's something you cannot, you can't take out. Focus on that and follow in the example of our Lord Jesus, who is our paradoxical shepherd and lamb. And you'll see the importance of that in 31 to 36. So let's read 31 to 36. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. There it is. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for thy sake, we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. For anyone who has any qualms about this intercession idea, I'll get to it again. But just as a heads up, before the recent reconciliation back in 2018 between the two synods, the synod in America, the Ethiopian church, the Ethiopian Orthodox church, of course, made a decision on this issue. And it was, to me, embarrassing that they had to say anything at all. But it just, different teachings, even up to the level of a bishop, had spread. And we had two different bishops teaching two different things on the subject. And the one who emphasized the biblical scriptural position here, his side won out. And the other side, when we reconciled, had no issues with that. They supported that. The Reverend Thomas Hopko, a blessed memory, was the former dean at St. Vladimir's Orthodox Seminary, the most famous Orthodox seminary in the Western Hemisphere, as far as I'm concerned. He has a great podcast, The Names of Jesus. You could still go and listen to it. Search Thomas Hopko, Names of Jesus, Intercession, Mediation. Thomas Hopko, Names of Jesus, Intercession, Mediation. I sent that to a Pentecostal friend who, from their point of view, had the opposite direction misunderstanding of this gentle issue. And for me, it's a misunderstanding of the incarnation. Some of the Ethiopian Orthodox, I think, misunderstand it in favor of full divinity uh, swallowing humanity, as was said of Eutyches. And it, you know, it doesn't surprise me some of these people are called Monophysites rather than Miaphysites. On the Pentecostal side, also Ethiopians, I've seen some of them misunderstand it in the other way, just trying to make Jesus only human, as if there's no divinity. And the Orthodox Christian position on this has been clear throughout the ages. As far as I'm concerned, this is a basic misunderstanding of the mystery of the Incarnation. So go back and study that. Listen to Thomas Hobko. Reach out to Bishop Barnabas of Southern California and Alaska if you want someone specifically from our communion. Although for me... The Greeks have the same teaching, as far as I'm concerned on the subject. Getting back to 31 to 36, you are invited to read aloud Psalm 44, according to the Hebrew of the Masoretes, and Psalm 43 in the Old Greek. You are a sheep for the slaughter. Read the greater context. That's what you're being invited to do. Abraham Lincoln and his Confederate counterparts, the Ethiopian Defense Forces, and the TPLF or the TDF, any sort of groups that claim to be Christian that are at war with one another. I don't mean a spiritual war, but a physical war. Everybody always thinks God is on their side. Well, God is on the side of people for wh whom his will are lined up like sheep for the slaughter, as in Psalm 44. The genuine Jesus followers. Okay? Whether it comes or not to you, those who are prepared for being slaughtered as sheep, those are the people who God is on the side of.
And it's better to say they're on the side of God in that case. Anyway, let's finish up the chapter 37 to the end. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. You want to be on God's side? You want to win? You want to have victory? You want to prevail? We prevail, not through our own might, but through his love for us, for our sake. Don't try to trap him in a box or in a corner because of it. This is where some of the theologians have misstepped. Respect his judgment, which is to say his decision-making process. And place your upteenth, your utmost, your superlative, the highest degree of your trust in the love that he has for us, in his love for our sake. Glory to him for all things.